Welcome to the final module of the fourth week in parametrized algorithms. So this is going to be a very brief discussion about de-randomization. Given that all week we have been talking about randomized methods, the title de-randomization can feel a bit off topic, but uh, really this is just to satisfy any curiosity that you might have about whether the randomized algorithms that we have discussed have deterministic variants and in particular is there a process by which the random experiment can be replaced with some sort of a deterministic procedure that does the same job. Now it turns out that there is no magical way of doing this automatically and in particular uh, doing it in a way that gives you some sort of a promise of efficiency, if not the same efficiency, at least something that is close, uh, that's not clear. But many randomized algorithms do lend themselves to natural de-randomization procedures. And I'll just use color coding as a running example to introduce you to the kind of uh, methods that exist to perform de-randomization. So I'll just be introducing this one combinatorial object called a hash family and we will see how that can be used to de-randomize. We won't really get into the construction of these hash families and in the interest of time I'll also not be introducing the other analogous com combinatorial objects that can be used for some of the other methods that we have seen like chromatic coding or random separation. So this is just going to be a very focused and a very brief discussion. If you're really interested in more than you could look up the de-randomization section in uh, the textbook and you will find a few more details there but um, even the textbook presentation doesn't actually get into the construction of most of these combinatorial objects that you're going to need to perform the de-randomization so if you're really interested in those there are some pointers on the course website so you can check them out but for now let's just get an idea of how this business of de-randomization works. So let's go back to the good event in the k-path problem where the random experiment that was employed by the color coding algorithm involved coloring every vertex of the graph uniformly at random with one of k colors and of course these experiments were independent across all vertices. So Notice that the good event for us was that if we focused our attention on the k vertices that are involved in some path, we wanted these vertices to get all distinct colors. So how do we replace this random engine with something deterministic? Well, one natural thing to try is to simply loop over all possible colorings. That would account for every possible eventuality of this random experiment and it would do the job. But notice that the problem with this is that it's way too expensive. So we would definitely want to avoid this. But at the same time, instead of working with a one-shot random coloring or even with multiple random random colorings, we want to work with a carefully chosen collection of colorings, which has two key properties. One, of course, is that the collection should not be too large. It should be a manageably sized collection. And the second thing is that, well, we don't know where the path is going to be. It could be any subset of K vertices. Therefore, what we want is that for every subset of K vertices, there must be some coloring in our collection that takes ownership of that subset. It says, look, if this was the subset which formed the path, then I am a coloring which will color these vertices with distinct colors. So let's write all that down just to recap. So what we want is some collection of colorings which we are going to formalize as functions from 1 to n to 1 to k, where k denotes the size of your palette. In this case, it's also the size of the solution that you're looking for. And n is, of course, the number of vertices in the graph. So you can think of 1 to n as representing the vertex set of g. So what you want is a collection of functions from 1 to n to 1 to k, which has the property that for any subset of 1 to n of size k, you want that there is some function, there could possibly be more than one function, but there should be at least one, which is such that it's injective if you were to restrict it to these k vertices. Of course, since you're restricting to k vertices and you promised that it's injective and the range also has size 
size k, it will in fact end up being bijective. But the reason I have used the term injective is to really emphasize that colors don't repeat when you focus on this subset of k vertices. So the crucial thing, of course, was the first thing that we mentioned, which is that we want this collection of colorings to be small, because you can imagine that you can come up with such a collection quite easily by simply going through every subset of size k and just uh, coming up with a function that is specialized to that subset. So you could say, look, I'm going to color this subset injectively and do something arbitrary on the rest. And this would be a perfectly valid collection, but it would have size and choose k which is still not good enough for us so well we will not get into the construction of uh, you know efficient collections that have this property but let me at least just give you some intuition for why you hope to do better than this very naive approach that i just described so let's say that we have this abstract version of the domain and the range the domain being one through n and the range being one through k now let's just look at some function from n to k denoted by uh, just the way that these elements are colored that tells you which element they map to. So if you look at just this one function then notice that uh, there are a lot of subsets that are mapped injectively. So you could pick any one of the blue elements and then pick any one of the yellow ones, either one of the two pink ones and one of the three green ones and one of the three light blue ones. So any combination of these elements and i think there are like some 288 of these so that's four times four times two times three times three so whatever that works out to there's that many subsets that are colored injectively by just this one function so you hope that you can choose your functions cleverly now i'm sure you can come up with functions that are also terrible for the goal that you have in mind they don't really uh, color a substantial number of subsets injectively at all so for instance if there was a function that mapped all elements to the same element in the range then this function is no good and you wouldn't want to include it in your solution. So you can carefully craft your collection of functions in such a way that it somehow uh, does take care of you want every function to do a lot of work for you and um, you know that's kind of at least uh, a very very high level intuition for why you even hope for something like this to be possible. To actually craft such a collection it turns out that you go via a more general notion called splitters and it turns out that this is just a uh, useful generalization to work with and it allows you to construct uh, the kind of collections that we need uh, by just working through it in uh, two steps in a certain way. Now I'm not going to really elaborate on this here but I'm going to introduce the definition of a splitter because I believe this is also something that comes up in the assignment so let's just go through the definition. So here we have a slightly more general situation where we're looking at functions from 1 to n to 1 to l and what you want is subsets of size k to be split uh, evenly. Now of course if um, l is at least k then you know this question of splitting evenly just ends up being the same as the function being injective but let's say that l is smaller than k then the question of splitting uh, would be a little more um, general so for instance let's say that we have l being 5 as before and let's say k is 2 times l so what does it mean that a function splits a subset of size 2 times l let's focus on uh, this subset so the subset is all the colored elements i believe there are uh, 10 of them here and i want you to pause here and think about whether this function uh, this function has been projected on these 10 elements does this function actually split this set so would you consider this to be a valid um, a good function for this particular subset well, if you think about it and just look at the pre-image of, uh, of the blue element and the green element, you will see that there are three elements that are mapped to the blue element and just one that is mapped to the green element. But notice that from the definition previously, what we wanted was the pre-image of any pair of elements from 1 to L to differ by the sizes of the pre-images. We wanted them to differ by at most one. And therefore, this 
particular example, this is not really a valid split. So it turns out that you can construct, um, you know, the kind of collections that we were looking for, which by the way are called NK perfect hash families. That's what you need to de-randomize the color coding algorithm. They are really just NKK splitters if you think about it. And it turns out that one way to construct a NKK splitter is to compose a NKK square splitter with a K square KK splitter. So notice that a NKK square splitter is a collection of functions that map 1 to n to 1 to k squared and a k squared kk splitter is a collection of functions that maps the domain 1 to k squared to 1 to k. So if you were to compose these functions then uh, you will end up with functions that map 1 to n to 1 to k and uh, it's just useful to do it in these two steps. Now I will not be getting into the details of uh, how this composition is done but I will state the result for you. So what you get once you go through this process is um, nk perfect hash family of size e to the k k to to the order log k times log n. Now if you notice uh, what we had previously was uh, a random experiment and the cost of boosting uh, the success probability was e to the k. So we wanted to repeat our experiment e to the k times to get our error probabilities down to a constant. Now instead of doing that you kind of replace that whole process with just this one giant for loop over all the functions in your nk perfect hash family. So it's going to take you e to the k, k to the order log k, n log n time up front to construct this family. Once the family is uh, available, then it's going to be the cost of the dynamic programming, which if you remember was two to the k times n or so. So it's going to be that multiplied by the number of functions that you're working with, and that is e to the k, k to the order log k times log n. So it's really a k to the order log k times log n additional multiplicative expense to get rid of the randomization and to have the peace of mind that you will always get the right answer if you used this combinatorial construct. And as I said, there are analogous combinatorial objects that you can use to de-randomize algorithms based on chromatic coding as well as random separation. And I would really encourage you to look up uh, section 5.6 in the textbook if you're interested in uh, learning about what those objects are. But with this very brief discussion, I just wanted to give you an overview of the way in which you hope for some of these randomized algorithms uh, to be de-randomized. So I hope you enjoyed this little tour through randomized methods for coming up with FPT algorithms and I think the overall theme has been that the algorithms themselves are typically really easy to explain and easy to implement. They're elegant in their descriptions uh, but they usually involve uh, interesting and non-trivial analysis to show that they actually work out the way that you hope for them to uh, work out at the end. So that brings us to a wrap in terms of our explorations for week four. I hope that we can continue this conversation over at the Discord community as well as the mailing lists, especially if you're watching this during an active run of the course. Thanks very much for watching and we will see you next week.